today I'm here to talk to you about food and sex. <laughs> Actually, I'll be talking about human nutrition and reproduction, but hopefully just as interesting. It turns out that diet and reproductive success are really important parts of our story as a species. Our incredible evolutionary success is largely a consequence of our evolutionary history. I'm an anthropologist, which means that, put quite simply, I study people. I study human beings all around the world, past and present. And I'm a behavioral ecologist, which means that I'm particularly interested in looking at the ways in which human behaviors evolved in response to ecological pressures. So this means that my work crosses many different disciplines. Anatomy, biology, medicine, nutrition, neurology, even microbiology. What I do focuses on the intersection between diet, reproduction, and behavior in the context of human evolution. And my work revolves around the ways in which human mothers are unique. Women are strikingly different than their great ape counterparts in a number of ways. We have a late age at first birth, comparatively, and we have a short interbirth interval, which means in the absence of birth control, the amount of time we take in between births. We also wean our infants comparatively early, and we give birth to dependent children. They rely on us for an extended period of time. So what this means when you put it all together is that human mothers have an incredibly difficult task, one that isn't faced by any other animal on the planet, right? So we give birth to these very large-brained, helpless infants who rely on us for long periods of time, and our short inner birth interval means that we resume ovulation more quickly. So this means that moms can essentially stack their kids, right? You can have an unweaned infant, a two-year-old, a five-year-old, and a seven-year-old, all reliant upon you for an extended period of time. So how do moms do it? How do moms accomplish this Herculean task? And how did our ancestors do it? These were the questions that I set out to answer over 10 years ago when I was in graduate school. I wanted to sort out how diet composition and reproduction in our evolutionary past might have mapped onto changes in social behavior and child-rearing patterns. So this took me to the shores of Lake Yasi in northern Tanzania, East Africa, where I met and began working with a group of foragers, or hunter-gatherers, called the Hadza. The Hadza are unique, not because they're a Stone Age population. They're just as modern and contemporary as you and me, but because they live a life in the absence of agriculture and in the absence of permanent dwellings which is much like the lives that our ancestors lived over 95% of human evolutionary history. So this made them an important place to start, an important place to start asking these questions about how reproduction and diet can influence social behavior and child rearing. So the first thing that I wanted to figure out is what the Hadza ate. So diet composition is really important, and diet is related to all of the rest of my questions because quintessentially human behaviors, kind of watershed moments in human evolutionary history have been linked to diet composition. Things like pair bonding, family structure, tool making, cooperation, even our increased longevity, our long lives, have all been in some way linked with diet. And diet was, of course, really relevant to this question that I had about how humans evolved this strange life history pattern where females of the species are not only responsible for taking care of an unweaned infant, but also have to maintain economic productivity in order to feed themselves, as well as multiple other older children. This is a really strange evolutionary puzzle, and diet was at the center of it. And what I found during this time, after working with the Hadza, is that they have an incredibly well-balanced diet. Like all other subtropical foraging populations, the Hadza eat a really well-balanced seasonal diet that contains all sorts of fruits, nuts, seeds, legumes, tubers, meat, and honey. And I also found out that there are incredible sex differences in diet composition. So men and women target different foods. So I first went to Tanzania in the summer of 2004 in order to start asking these questions. And this was, a, this, was a, this was a big question for me, right? This was, um, I had to follow my questions into the field. So this California native who had happily lived her entire life in the suburbs, happily, never camped, once, <laughs> found myself living in Tanzania, East Africa, amongst a population who hunts their game animals with poison-tipped arrows, and where women dig up to two or three feet in the ground in order to extract their daily supply of vegetables. 
Thankfully, the Hadza took great care of me. So good, in fact, that I've been returning every year, almost sometimes twice a year, for 12 years. I keep going back. And it's because diet is related to all of these things, right? So when I started looking at sex differences in diet composition, I started coming across some really interesting and intriguing things. Turns out that men focus their foraging efforts on meat and honey, which makes up about 45% of the annual diet composition, the rest coming from plant foods, right? Surprise number one. And they target the honey from both stinging and stingless bees. And they target the hives of the African killer bee with the assistance of a bird called the honey guide bird, aptly named indicator indicator. Right? This will make more sense in a moment, right? Why this is a perfect name. So the honey guide bird calls down to the Hadza honey hunter, chatters down to him, the honey hunter whistles back, and they communicate back and forth through a series of chatters and whistles until the bird leads the honey hunter to the hive. Once he finds the tree, which is house, housing the beehive, he hammers pegs into the hive, climbs up. Sometimes the hive is located 20 to 30 feet in the air. Once he's there, he smokes the hive in order to pacify the bees. He retrieves his prize of honeycomb. And if the honey guide bird is lucky, it will get access to some of the scraps, the wax, and some of the bees. More often than not, however, Hadza men like to leave the bird hungry. They like to leave it a little hungry in order to incentivize it to lead him to a hive in the future. Okay? It turns out that our sweet tooth has deep evolutionary roots and that honey and larva were critically important foods in our evolutionary past. Some of our oldest rock art depicts figures smoking out beehives. And it's not just kid food. Hadza men, women, and children alike rank honey as their number one preferred food item. And we can't forget about the kids. They're an incredibly important part of the story. Hadza kids are very industrious. Many of them, by the time they're five, can collect up to half of their own daily nutritional requirements. So while Hadza men focus on meat and honey, and children focus on anything they can reliably collect, from berries to fruits to tubers to small game animals, women target plant foods. Women forage in groups, and they tend to focus on um, underground storage organs, tubers, which act as food and water reserves for the plant. And they can be sometimes buried two to three feet underground. They're a staple of the Hadza diet. They're available year round. When they're not available, women focus on other foods. They focus a lot on fruits and berry species, many different types. One particular fruit they focus collection on is called the baobab fruit. You may have heard of it. The baobab fruit is quickly becoming the new American superfruit sensation. So if you want to eat like a hunter-gatherer, you can. Simply take yourself to your closest local food market and pick up a bag of baobab superfruit chews. They're really high in vitamin C, and they're, um, they're delicious. So go have some baobab after today's TED Talks. So now that I'd figured out what basic diet composition was, right, what the Hadza were eating and how this mapped onto foraging behavior, I could start asking some more complicated questions. I was very lucky to be part of an international team that looked at the Hadza gut microbiome. And we were really interested in looking at the bacterial species that live inside the Hadza gut for a few reasons. Not only because this would reveal a lot about how these bacterial species are our fellow travelers in human evolution, but it would also tell us something about diet composition and potentially also about reproduction. And our results were striking. What we found is that the Hadza gut microbe ecosystem is far more diverse than Western populations. So populations like us in the US living in a post-industrialized Western context, they not only had more species of bacteria, but they had different types of bacteria. So it turns out that the Hadza gut microbiome is adapted for broad spectrum carbohydrate metabolism, which makes sense given all the, poly, all the complex polysaccharides that are in their diet, right? So this kind of made sense. We also found out that men and women are differentially adapted to their diet. So living in the same environment, with access to the same resources, men and women are differentially adapted to food composition. This was a profound break with traditional thinking on nutrition and reproduction. We've often thought that women in small-scale foraging societies like the Hadza were targeting low-quality plant foods. Okay? Turns out that Hadza women contain bacteria in their guts that allows them to more efficiently digest the fibrous foods that they're consuming. So it turns out diet does tell us something relevant about 
reproduction. So now that I'd figured out what the Hadza were eating, who's doing what, right, who's doing what type of foraging behavior, and how these bugs in their gut allow women to more effectively capture the nutrition they need to support reproduction, I was able to start answering my second big question, which was how do moms get the assistance that they need in order to feed all of the hungry mouths that they are responsible for? So I went about answering this in a number of ways. I looked at who was feeding children, which you might think is an easy thing to do. Trust me, it was not. I also looked at who was taking care of children, who was holding them, caring for them, teaching them important tasks. And what I found in over a decade of data collection is something that we've heard for a very long time. It takes a village to raise a child. Scores of people help out. And not just Hadza women, women in every other small-scale foraging population for which we have data. Women have a constellation of helpers available to them, far beyond the nuclear family. So I'd found it. This was my answer. This was it. This is how women were doing it. And they were relying on others. And during the Paleolithic, environments like Lake Yasi, where the Hadza live, early members of our genus, early female members of our genus would have had to rely on others not only in order to survive, but to flourish. Approximately 2.5 million years ago, our genus, genus Homo, evolved. And we now know that climatic shifts opened up new resources to our ancestors. And they started targeting these new high-quality foods, much like the wild foods in the Hadza diet that I studied, meat, tubers, and honey. And we know that these changes in our evolutionary past mapped onto changes in our neural anatomy when our brains expanded. And we know that this was largely tethered to these high-quality food items. And we know that our ancestors were eating these foods because their anatomy began reflecting that shift. Smaller teeth and smaller guts designed to eat a generalized diet composed of high-quality foods. We have enjoyed remarkable biological success as a species. We occupy every corner of the globe, from desert environments to the Arctic. Our ability to capture nutrition from a wide variety of resources and eat a generalized diet, coupled with our ability to cooperate, may be the true hallmarks of human evolution. Our evolutionary legacy is to help rear one another's children. Pleistocene moms didn't do it alone. They relied on a lot of other people, their partners, their mothers, their sisters, their friends, unrelated members of the community, just like we do today. And this assistance comes in all different shapes and sizes, from nannies to childcare providers to playgroups to friends, grandparents, teachers, even sports teams coaches. All of this community investment, all of it, has deep evolutionary roots. Thank you.